Welcome to the virtual panel COVID-19 and uh, human health behavior, impacts and trends. We are so happy to have you all here. It's organized by the Brazilian Academy of Sciences and the German National Academy of Le Sciences Leopoldina. Both academies have been organizing joint workshops and other events in scientific disciplines as diverse as water research, environment, science, uh, environment sciences and health, and this is the first virtual panel cooperation between both academies. So welcome to, to, uh, to this special event for the Brazilian Academy. This is a very special year too, as the Academy celebrates its 105th anniversary. Congratulations. Before I will lead over to our experts, I want to introduce myself very shortly. My name is Vivian Uppmann. I'm a German a journalist and a freelance a moderator. I'm your host today. And I can tell you that it's an honor for me to be here with you today. Please welcome our panelists. And our panelists can uh, switch on or turn on the cameras uh, right now. Um, you can see Professor Dr. Margaret Dalcomo right now from the Oswaldo Cruz Foundation, Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. You see Professor Dr. Ralf Hertwig from the Max Planck Institute for Human Development in Berlin, Germany. You see Professor Fernando Figuera, a member of the Honorary Scientific Adversary Group of um, Rob's uh, Uruguay, <laughs> sorry for that. And you see Professor Catherine Milkman. She's a professor of operations, informations and decisions at the Wharton School, University of Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, USA. And we will welcome our um, audience from the whole world and our translator. Very happy to see you all. Um, yeah, we, we'd like to have a discussion with you. And that's why we are looking forward to your questions, if you want to. You can uh, use our Q&A function um, to write down your questions if you are on Zoom. So to, to those who are on Zoom, please uh, use the Q&A function. Um, you can find it uh, at the lower control board in the lower part of your screen, I mean. And we also offer a translation in Portuguese for those who are on Zoom. Please check your toolbar. And for those who are on YouTube, uh, just listen to us. We are happy to hear you too or to see you. Yeah, the Brazilian Academy streams this event live via YouTube, both in English and in Portuguese. I would like to extend a warm welcome to you, to all the viewers on YouTube and on Zoom. So after having discussed the technical matters, um, I would like to give a brief thematic introduction. Today we will discuss the three main questions, I think. Question one is how has human health related behavior changed during the pandemic? And we are already facing more than one year now. Question two is which behavior will outlast this period? And question three is how to um, try public or private actors to guide behavior. The COVID-19 pandemic has made people behave differently. Our invited speakers represent different disciplines to discuss COVID-19 and human health behavior impacts and trends. And that's why um, I want to start right now. With our first uh, speaker today, uh, this is Professor Dr. Margaret Dalcolmo from Brazil. Thank you so much for accepting our invitation. Since I already talked a lot, I'm happy to introduce uh, your topic right now. Um, she is a medicine, a specialized in tuberculosis, and she's a clinical researcher, respiratory physician and professor. She has been participating in international clinical trials and currently she's conducting phase three global TB alliance for tuberculosis, simply TB and brace trial for BCG vaccine to COVID-19 in HCW. 
From your health perspective, Professor Malcolmo, how has the health-related behavior in Brazil changed during the pandemic? Well, uh, good morning. Uh, still morning in Brazil, and thank you so much for this prestigious invitation, Vivian, and so a sweet introduction. And I'm very honored to be here among this, uh, these colleagues from all over. And uh, first of all, I would like to comment on that uh, Brazil has been heavily richer by the epidemic since the, the end of February of, of late year. And since the very beginning, we could, uh, we didn't, uh, I used to joke that we didn't have time to perplexity. Brazil has been uh, coping with the very, I would say, heavy epidemic, as I mentioned. And since the very beginning, we suffered the lack of a co uh, central coordination in the epidemic since the really, uh, the, the real very beginning. So the paradox between the official rhetorics of the Brazilian government and the and the, our discourse, I, I mean the scientific discourse, the researchers and the medical uh, officers uh, has been very paradoxical in Brazil, and it uh, compromised very very heavily the social behavior and the understanding of the Brazilian population, and and it contributed in a very bad way to the to the bad outcomes that we are seeing in Brazil so far. And so in terms of the, the, the impact of in, not only in the, in the public opinion, but in the behavior, as we can see the negation uh, so heavily, I would say um, um, made as an official discourse by the government certainly uh, influenced very badly the younger, uh, the younger groups in Brazil. And so it, it is partially responsible for the changes in the epidemic behavior in the country. So we have a sort of youth, uh, of a youthening uh, behavior of the epidemiologically speaking of the epidemic in Brazil. So we are having now a new phase of the epidemic, of the epidemic compromise in younger people. And so, uh, and the negation of course reveals in another way, the social, the very, very heavy and shaming social inequalities in Brazil. So if we do analyze, for instance, morbidity and mortality in the country, we are going to check that it is related to the social level. So poor and black people died more, poor and black people in excluded populations uh, not only didn't understand exactly what, what I am personally being involved in and providing good information for the trying to provide provide good information for the population, but so it made a sort of confusion in on this uh, regard. So I would uh, finish this first uh, comment, uh, Vivian, saying that we have two good outcomes that have to be remarked in this, in this discussion for us to discuss further uh, later on. So uh, the, the participation of the Brazilian scientific com 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 uh, community, which is now recognized by the Brazilian population, some uh, each time that I am recognized when I go, for instance, to the supermarket, it means something that people recognize that doctors and medical people and researchers, we have been uh, involved in the, in the, in the epidemic and in, in the whole thing of the epidemic. And the second good outcome is that uh, we uh, sort of detect that Brazilian culture never responded with the heavy participation in terms of volunteering from the private sector. Sector. And this is something that has to be remarked as well. So we are having for the first time in the Brazilian culture in facing an epidemic, a heavy participation of the private sector funding uh, contributions and donations. And this is something that I really hope that we can sort of introduce a new a new issue in terms of Brazilian behavior on this regard. So saying this, I would finish now and then and respond to the second question. Okay, thanks for this good news. Um, it's always good to hear a good outcome too. And um, you're right, I have a second question. Um, do you recognize a change of people's handling of information or misinformation during the last month? 
Well, uh, we are we are making a very, I would say, compromised effort. I mean, I'm speaking on behalf of the scientific committee. So we are coping with uh, all this misinformation provided by some some uh, sectors of the official uh, discourse in Brazil, uh, even politics. The the level of bad, I would say, very bad. I would insist on this bad politicization, if I may use this term that the, the official discourse took uh, in terms of providing information is, is still making a good confusion among the, particularly the, the, the non-favorable uh, groups, social groups in Brazil. So it has been very, very complicated for us in a sort of this, dismissing this and, you know, and clarifying every information. Every day when I go to newspapers, I write in a big newspaper every week providing good information, but it's not available, it's not accessible to the poor uh, and, 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 and excluded populations in Brazil. And to finish, we have to figure out that when I am speaking about about excluded and poor population, I am speaking about 19.19 million people living under the poverty line in Brazil and 12 million people living in slums. And so this is something that you have to figure out to understand the social uh, world, the social scenario in which I am speaking on. Thank you so much for this short or brief introduction into your situation in Brazil right now. We are traveling to Germany um, to Professor Dr. Ralf Hertwig from Berlin. Um, and we will come back to you later, Professor Daikomo. Thank you so much at this point. Um, yeah, talking about Professor Dr. Ralf, uh, Ralf Hertwig. Uh, he has been awarded several prizes for his research and teaching. His research, uh, his, his research focuses um, on models of bounding rationality or bounded rationality, on decisions from experience and on deliberated ignorance. So, um, Professor Dr. Hertwig, you will talk to us from a cognitive, uh, cognitive perspective. Could you please tell us how public or private actors can use tools like nudging or boosting to guide our behavior? Uh, sure, I can, and uh, maybe I, I do that in uh, a little bit later. But first, let me step back and say a few words on what I find so fascinating about this pandemic. Uh, I think what is really fascinating is uh, it is a crisis in which uh, human behavior matters enormously. Um, and you saw that in particular in the initial state of the pandemic where there weren't any vaccines and uh, there wasn't any medical treatment uh, for, the, uh, for the coronavirus. And uh, we all bet, or the policymakers all across the world bet on human behavior. Now we do that also in some other areas and some other global crises. So for instance, if you think about climate change uh, or our personal behaviors as consumers, and there often the argument is that human behavior is very inert. It's actually really difficult to change human behavior. Now, what I find so truly fascinating about the pandemic is that we all changed our behavior within a very short period of time. And we just did it dramatically. I mean, who would have thought that we could be able to stop traveling, that we would all, or many of us would work from home, that we would keep physical distance, that we wear masks, that we stop going to restaurants, museums, theaters, cinemas, that we stop seeing friends and family. That's amazing. It's an amazing feat. And I think uh, it will be the task of psychologists, but more generally behavioral scientists to figure out what are the drivers of this behavioral change. And there are a couple of candidates uh, and we did some research on that very question and I can tell you a little bit about it. So one clear candidate is risk perception that we were all afraid. Uh, but interestingly, yes, there is a clear relationship between risk perception, fear and behavior change in the very beginning of the pandemic. But then with the course of the pandemic, there was actually a divorce between risk perception and actual behavior. So risk perception played a role originally, but not long term. I do think that good communication, and I think Margaret already alluded to that, good communication is incredibly important as a behavior, as a driver for behavior. Uh, one of the studies that we did, for instance, showed, and that is very surprising, that uh, actually many people appreciated the inclusion of uncertainty in the communication, that they were fully aware that there's a lot of uncertainty around this pandemic and also in the scientific knowledge about it. 
and they wanted that to be mentioned and brought up. Margaret uh, alluded to that as well, trust in institutions, trust in science, trust in institutions, trust in the political system. And you don't have to go to the US and Donald Trump and you don't have to go to Brazil. You see that also in Germany, for instance. Uh, we did a study in which we looked into who is downloading the Corona warning app in Germany. And what you see is that the people who did not download it were much more filled with distrust toward the security of the technology, while those people who downloaded it were much more trusting toward the technology. And, and also that already came up, a final important driver is the infodemic, is the spread of misinformation that we've seen. And what is fascinating to see here as well is a number of uh, interesting studies that have already been conducted and published that show that connection. I'm just pointing you to one by Anton Golwitz, uh, published in Nature Human Behavior, in which he studied two groups of people, namely uh, Republicans that voted for Donald Trump and Democrats that voted for Hillary Clinton in 2016. And what he was able to show is that uh, the Republicans uh, exhibited 14% less physical distance in the early stage of the pandemic. And that group uh, was also very much uh, related, uh, was, very, very, was also very much uh, influenced by conservative media, in particular here uh, in terms of Fox News. And what he was also able to show is that this information actually had real ten, uh, tangible consequences in terms of higher infection rates and higher fatality rates. So this information, information ecology is enormously important for the way we behave. Another study was just published by Heidi Larson, a wonderful researcher from the UK, and she was showing that within the people who definitely want to be vaccinated, the recent misinformation uh, also had some impact. It uh, led to a decline in intent uh, to get vaccinated by 6.2% in the UK and 6.4% in the US among the people who wanted to get vaccinated. So I think that our information in ecology and the health of our information in ecology is an enormously important driver. And let me uh, wrap up here. I think what we need to do as behavioral scientists, we need to think about how do we build trust? How do we overcome partisan divide and effective polarization? We need to think more about what is good communication, including the inclusion of uncertainty. And of course, we need to think about resilience to misinformation among our citizens. So these are big tasks, but uh, they totally worth uh, thinking about it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, if you, dear audience, already have some questions, as mentioned before, you can already write down and use the Q&A function if you want to. You don't have to wait until the end of uh, our section. You can start whenever you want to and whenever you listen to somebody. So um, I already have a question. Um, I started with this question and I wanted to repeat it right now. Um, Professor Hertwig, uh, can you tell us something about uh, boosting and nudging? Mm -hmm. Um, now, these are two behavioral, evidence-based behavioral approaches to changing um, our behaviors. And the nudging approach uh, thinks more in terms of how we change the choice architecture. So not how much we change our cognition, but how do we change the external world so that the external world nudges us to do uh, whatever we hopefully want to do or whatever the policymaker wants us to do. Now, um, there's a lot of discussion on nudging also on the, uh, the potential paternalism in the nudging approach. And the alternative that we've been working on is called boosting. And boosting actually has the decided idea to really help people to become more competent, more competent in dealing with misinformation, more competent in understanding risk literacy. Uh, and um, in the end, leaving the decision with uh, the individual citizen rather than with the policymaker. What one in interesting observation for me about the pandemic is that this is a crisis in which we wanted a responsible, self-controlled, understanding citizen. We wanted a citizen who understands risk information, who is able to control his or her impulses, who is able to live up to the rules and regulations. And I think this is important. If we want a competent citizen, we also need to invest into competent citizens.
Thank you so much. And I don't know if I uh, said it at the beginning uh, when I introduced you, I want to add it right now. You are the director of the Center for Adaptive Rationality from the Max Planck Institute for Human Development in Berlin, Germany. And from you, we are traveling to virtual to Uruguay uh, right, now, uh, right now. Since we only have about 75 minutes today, um, I would like to welcome the head of the Uruguay Office of the United Nations Population Fund from Montevideo in Uruguay, Professor Fernando Figuera. Um, he worked uh, on social protection, gender equality on population and has advised governments. He received his PhD in social, uh, social, so, 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 sociology, <laughs> how sociology. do I pronounce it rightly? <laughs> sociology, thank you. And that's why I will ask you, Professor Figuera, from a social science and policy perspective, how has health related behavior changed during the pandemic? Thank you, Vivian, uh, and it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, let, let me try to go over a little bit of what my two previous colleagues mentioned. Uh, there seems to be a, a triad of factors that provides hope uh, for our capacity to adapt and to change, as, as Professor Ralph mentioned. I mean, this has been a major experiment in social and human behavior. I mean, uh, nowhere have we seen uh, in history, uh, in recent history before, such drastic changes in behavior. And uh, as it was mentioned too, I mean, we needed these non-pharmacological adaptive measures that people, uh, uh, and that we depended on people for that. What is that triad? That, that triad, Margaret mentioned it correctly, is first, a, a clear message, a unified, clear message from authorities regarding both the certainties and the uncertainties uh, in a way that we create a reflexive citizen that is able to cope with risk, but is not panicked by it. So th this was one of the first elements that had to be there. The second one is about trust, trust in those who produce those messages. Trust in science, trust in governments, trust in the political system, trust in role models in society at large. The third one is about the social conditions that are required so that people can adhere, can actually modify their behavior uh, in such a way that it helps contain the epidemic. Now, this is both a triad and a trilemma. It's almost impossible to get the three together for a long time working. Uh, as uh, Professor Ralph also mentioned, the perception of risk was critical at the start, but it became increasingly divorced. So it was not a sprint. It was a marathon that we had to run, keeping these three things in place so that human behavior would adapt adequately. And while I did my work on comparisons in Latin America, I'm going to concentrate in my country, in Uruguay, to provide an example of that. Why? Because Uruguay is the best example of success in 2020. In 2020, Uruguay remained a deviant case with almost no uh, community circulation of the virus. And how did it do it? When the first cases started, there was a clear message, A, by government, both on the certainties and uncertainties. There was a high perception of risk because our, our mirror was Spain and Italy that had been undergoing one of the worst uh, uh, pandemic uh, situations. Uh, there was, on the other hand, a lot of trust. As you know, Uruguay ranks high in Latin America in terms of trust on democracy, trust on the political system, trust on the institutions, etc. And thirdly, it had the largest formalized labor force, therefore unemployment insurance. It had the least poverty in Latin America by far. So all these three things allowed for uh, containing the virus, then a strong strategy of testing, tracing, and isolating, and 
This contributed to keeping the, the epidemic in check until October of 2020. And then we derailed. Then we lost our way. What happened? Did we drastically change behavior? Was that it? Well, actually the government appealed to a notion, a concept at the start of the pandemic that it was called responsible freedom. It did not quarantine obligatory. It, it asked people to remain in their houses. It provided some social support, but not enough. So the resilience that our society had in terms of trust and in terms of social capital to run a sprint was there. Then Tetris, tracing, testing, and isolating took the bulk of keeping the epidemic in check. But slowly, the question was not when the epidemic was going to start having an exponential curve, but when, when. And it happened, of course, because it's impossible to change behavior to the level in which a virus of these characteristics will be contained with high mobility. So at that point, the government had a choice. Close down again, send a strong message, or try to keep the economy working and pray so that behavior will adapt in such a responsible way that even with community circulation, we would be able to cope with it. We weren't. We have already consumed a large part of our stock of resilience, of the social capital we had and of the trust we had. And as the epidemic evolved and the government did not take the decisions that I believe it should have taken, that led to an increase that places today Uruguay as the country with the highest per capita death toll in the world. So the country that was the example until October uh, derailed and since March of this year, it became the worst case scenario. How did we miss our capacity to understand how much we could ask of human behavior and how much we had to ask of binding governmental decisions that would provide the floor so that behavior could keep going on. This is overall, I mean, my reflection, and it leads directly to the issue that Margaret uh, posed for Latin America. The levels of inequality in Latin America and Uruguay, even though less so, uh, require to solve this problem of a triad that we need working throughout the month, it requires a basic safety net, a universal basic safety net so that we don't turn a triad into a trilemma, into an impossibility in which it is impossible to have a successful epidemiological strategy to mitigate the social cost and to keep trust we start losing those three elements unless we pull in the government and the states to provide basic safety nets in a context of high inequality and differential risks. Thank you so much. Muchísimas gracias. <laughs> it has been very interesting. And um, I will now lead over to um, Professor Catherine Milkman. We will come back to you and your um, insights, of course, uh, later. Uh, so, uh, dear audience, if you uh, already have questions, just feel free to, to put the questions into the Q&A function. But now, Professor Catherine Milkman, um, you are from Wharton School, University of Pennsylvania, Philadelphia. Um, and um, you are the host of a very popular behavioral economics podcast and the former president of the International Society for Judgment and Decision Making. Um, your research explores ways of changing behaviors for good. And you wrote a book about uh, this with the beautiful title, How, the Cha uh, How to Change the Science of Getting from Where You Are to Where You Want to Be. So I would like to know, in your um, study on vaccinations, what have you learned in terms of influencing human health behavior? Yeah, my team about almost exactly a year ago decided that we were going to put our energies towards trying to understand what kind of communication and what kind of nudges would be most effective 
to encourage vaccination during the phase that we're entering in the US now. I realize different countries around the world are at different phases in their vaccination campaigns, but here in the US, we are at a point where um, we're very lucky, frankly, to be at this point. There's more vaccinations available than there are people interested in taking them. And in order to make sure we reach herd immunity and, and that we don't have more horrible uh, loss of life due to this pandemic than is, you know, frankly, th there was some amount that there was no preventing, but uh, we wanna minimize that going forward. We need to find ways to communicate effectively about the vaccine. So about this time last year, a team that I co-lead with Angela Duckworth and about 150 scientists around the world who were interdisciplinary, we decided we were going to focus our attention on doing what we call mega studies. These are massive randomized controlled trials, uh, testing different messages to encourage vaccination. And we wanted to have results that would be available by now. And in order to do that, and with no vaccine yet available last June, we decided to try to test messaging during the fall flu season to encourage flu vaccinations. We wanted to make sure we were really measuring behavior rather than intentions to get a vaccine because uh, we've seen actually since that intent, what people say will change their behavior and what actually changes their behavior are almost uncorrelated. And we wanted, we wanted something that was, was more robust than an intention. So these mega studies ended up being conducted last fall in partnership with Walmart pharmacies. Walmart is a giant retailer in the United States. Um, they have 4,700 pharmacy locations around the country and also with two local health systems, Penn Medicine and Geisinger Health, which have um, millions of patients that they see each year. And we did tests with about 700,000 pharmacy customers of different messages, encouraging them to come into the pharmacy and get a flu vaccine in the fall. And also with um, about 50,000 patients who had healthy visits with their doctors where they would be offered a flu vaccine. And the dozens of different messages we tested included uh, a wide range of persuasion tactics from telling people a joke you know, have you heard the one about the flu? Don't spread it around to see if humor might add a little levity and, and capture attention effectively around encouraging people in this text reminder to get a vaccine to telling them, hey, everybody else is doing it. This is a really popular thing to do. You should do it too, or do it to protect your family and your friends and neighbors. Uh, we even had an option to dedicate your shot to a loved one, text back and tell us who you're dedicating it to. So we actually tested different messages at both sites because trying to convince someone to come into a pharmacy to get a vaccine is very different than trying to convince someone to get a vaccine when their doctor offers it to them in the doctor's office. But interestingly, despite having a lot of different methods we tested in both settings, at every one of the sites where we ran these experiments, we found that the very same message rose to the top and that message was a very simple, um, I'll say plain vanilla kind of message you would typically get from a healthcare provider that said, we have a shot reserved for you or waiting for you, come and get it and, or accept it when it's offered. Um, that reserved for you, waiting for you language performed better than other language. I, and I should say, statistically speaking, there were ties, but uh, it was the top performer. If you just look at absolute performance, at Penn Medicine, at Geisinger Health, which are rural and urban health systems, and at um, Walmart pharmacies, which we thought was pretty remarkable. Uh, it, we also found when we did sort of a, you know, an attribute analysis of what was effective at both sites, it was important to have really um, formal messaging, the kind of message that was congruent with what you usually get from your prov provider, things like the joke that felt out of place in a professional relationship actually didn't do very well. So that was another key takeaway. We thought maybe getting clever and, and cute and informal would be effective. It wasn't. Instead, what we saw was this very simple endowment effect type message. And you know, we've thought a lot about why did that rise to the top at all these sites. And I wanted to mention a few hypotheses. We, we don't have data on the mechanism driving it, just the key result that this was very effective at both at all of these sites. But some reasons it might have been so effective include the endowment effect, which tells us that when you feel something belongs to you, you actually value it more, you're less willing to give it up. So maybe when I say it's waiting for you or reserved for you, now it feels like yours and someone's gonna come take your dose if you don't go get it. We don't like giving things up, losing things and giving them up feels worse than gaining the same thing feels good. 
Uh, it may also be that it conveys this is the default. So we're expecting you to get this vaccine. We've set it aside for you. We've defaulted you into it. And there's two pieces of psychology that feel relevant there. One is that um, because I'm conveying that it's been reserved for you, you may think, oh, this is not going to be much of a hassle. It's going to be really easy. Defaults are typically simpler. I don't have to worry about, do they really have my dose? And the other is that may imply a recommendation, right? Your doctor's office or your pharmacy is saying this is the right thing for you to do. Otherwise, why would they have reserved it for you? So um, we've published uh, a paper about some of these results in the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences in the US and about the trial with the health systems. We have a working paper on uh, SSRN about our work with Walmart and we'll hopefully be publishing that later this summer. And I think hopefully the learnings from this will not only be useful to all the countries around the world that are approaching the moment we are facing in the United States, but also as we think about future challenges to change health behavior, that this kind of messaging may be useful. We we know that these were all text messages and text messages in general, we can show where these reminders were very effective tools for moving this decision and this particular language may be the kind that we wanna deploy or at least test in many settings. Thank you so much. I am, we learned a lot. Uh, joking is not helping uh, any time, <laughs> for example. Um, and I heard about your new work, um, testing a vaccine lottery in Philadelphia. Do you want to tell us something about that one too? Yeah, so um, as the situation has evolved here in the United States, the, we've moved from feeling that nudges that offer simply a different reframe of, med, of, of a message might not be enough. And we wanna get even more aggressive in our efforts to encourage vaccination given the, the stakes. And actually this was something we had hoped to test when we were doing the two trials I mentioned with you, which is the power of lotteries. We know from a lot of previous research that people overweight small probabilities of winning the large prize. The large prize is exciting, it draws attention, it draws media interest. So there's lots of free marketing that comes with it as well. Uh, but people can imagine themselves with that big prize and, and they know it's a low probability, but thinking about odds of one in a million, one in a thousand, the psychic math, we don't quite differentiate. And so people tend to respond to lotteries better than they would to a, the expected value of the lottery in terms of a cash payment. So we've been talking about doing this since last June uh, to encourage vaccinations. We talked with a number of different governments. A lot of states are rolling out programs a bit like this. We designed a program that we deployed and announced yesterday with the mayor's office in Philadelphia that has some unique features that build on science that we think may make it more effective than some of the other programs. It will also make it easier for us to evaluate its benefits in a really rigorous way. So we're pleased with that as well. And I should say, um, amazing team of collaborators, Richard Thaler is a Nobel laureate, was really the brains behind the operation. And I just was the muscle. And so it's been fun to work with him and uh, you know, a wonderful doctoral student, Linnea Gandhi and Angela Duckworth, Devin Pope, Kevin Volpe and Alison Buttenheim, a real team effort. Um, and Ayla Stanford, who's a really important doctor in Philadelphia, helping, uh, helping reach particularly under resourced communities. So the design features that are unique are the following. First, it's a, a concentrated geography, I should say. Uh, it's just a city instead of a statewide lottery. But another thing that's unique about it is we're giving out 36 prizes in three drawings over six weeks, and we're using a regret lottery form. So most of the lotteries, and actually I think all of the lotteries that are being used around the world, you have to have been vaccinated to have your name drawn. We're doing something else. Anyone can be drawn. We have a residential registry and we'll call you and say, were you vaccinated? If you were, you won $50,000. But if you weren't, you have to decline the money and it goes to someone else. What that means is that people might anticipate how awful it would feel to get that call and have to decline this large prize. And it may motivate extra people to get vaccinated. In fact, work by Kevin Volp has, has shown that these kinds of regret lotteries can be particularly effective. So that's a unique feature. And the other unique feature is that we are targeting priority zip codes. So in the US, our postal system, the, the country is divided up into zip codes. It's you know like a small postal region. Um, sometimes only 15,000 people live in a zip code, whereas there's 1 million in our city or 1.3 million in the city of Philadelphia. So zip codes are much narrow, ge narrower geographies. We identified 20 priority zip codes in the city where there's been a particular challenge with getting vaccinations out. These are 
as you might not be surprised to hear, uh, under-resourced communities, and they have the lowest vaccination rates. We identified, and that's about half the city, there's 46 zips in the city, 20 were identified as priority. And each of the three drawings, we two weeks before the money is drawn, we pick a, one of the 20 priority zips at random. So a, sort of a two round lottery and say half of the prizes in the next drawing will come from people who live in that zip. So the first zip we drew has a hundred, every people living in that zip could have a hundred times the chances of winning these prizes as people in the rest of the city. And there will be another announced in two weeks that has a similar increase in odds and so on. What this does is it also, um, it, it concentrates the attention on those zip codes and we'll be able to see if concentrated rewards are more effective. It also lends itself nicely to scientific evaluation because of the random nature of the zip code selection, we can compare any change in behavior in that zip code to the surrounding priority zips that just by chance weren't drawn and see what kind of boost we get. And, and it'll be a much cleaner identification of the benefit or lack thereof of this kind of incentive program than any of the others that are being rolled out. So we're really excited about the potential that has to impact these priority communities and to build knowledge about whether concentrating attention in these kinds of lotteries adds value. And we should have results. We'll be able to look at data on the impact of the first drawing in two weeks. Thank you so much. That have been so much input <laughs> of all of you. Um, I will start with the first question right now. And um, dear audience, you can add your questions if you want to. And um, I will repeat that um, more often um, until we will start to, to answer your questions. So um, I would like to know which behavior will outlast the pandemic. What do you think? Who wants, who wants to, to answer that question? I would like to, to, to raise a first comment on this, uh, yeah. Vivian. It, it depends. I would say that concerning the, the Brazilian society and the heterogeneity of the Brazilian society, the social inequalities, it depends. It depends on the social level. Because, for instance, the impact that we are seeing, uh, for instance, only to provide you on a very specific example uh, regarding the vaccines, Brazilians are very, very, I would say, addict to vaccination. The, the vaccination program in Brazil is internationally recognized as a very, very good one. So what happened in the, in the adherence of the, even the poor people vis-a-vis uh, -vis the vaccination, it is influenced by the, the bad discourse and the paradoxical discourse that we are seeing. So this is the reason why I'm telling you that the higher middle classes are adhering much more than the poor people that are much more influenced by, for instance, the evangelical discourse, the religious discourse mixed it up with the scientific one. So I would say that it depends socially as very strictly socially depending. Thank you. Would you, yeah, Professor Hertwig and then Fernando Figuera? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I mean, of course, there will be many things that are likely to stay, or at least in some version are going to stay. I mean, if you only think about um, the fact that a lot of our work and our interactions now occur digitally and no longer in, in physical ways, I think some of this is going to stay. And uh, I mean, it, and actually, I would say many things have also proven to be very liberating. Now, in terms of health behavior, I think it will be interesting to see what we learn from the pandemic. So, for instance, one of the things that we learned is that the rate of uh, uh, colds um, and influenza, in, in, at least in, in Europe, um, was much, much lower uh, than in previous years. And we shouldn't forget, in, I think it was in 2019, I think up to 20,000 20, people Uh, died as a result of uh, cold and influenza in Germany. Now, and of course, the reason is that we are all wearing masks and keeping distance. So one question is going to be to what extent are we going to enlist the same kind of behaviors that have proven to be quite protective in uh, also other contexts of our lives. And that will be a very interesting discussion. I think so too. Professor Figuera, you wanted to add something. Um, yeah. Also to comment on some of the previous things, but uh, regarding lasting behavior, I would I would say that it very much uh, I very much agree with Margaret. It depends on on social uh, economic status and on the capacity uh, to perform 
certain changes in time and, and sustain them in time, especially, for example, teleworking. All, all this we know it's not possible for everybody, uh, but it will it will remain something that uh, for upper middle classes, educated uh, workers, etc., will probably uh, become uh, more common. Uh, face mask wearing is another issue that I believe uh, will probably become more incorporated uh, as, as the pandemic lingers too, because that, that's uh, another thing. And thirdly, uh, regarding the issue of vaccinations and pro or anti-vaccinations and nudging or not nudging towards vaccinations, I think, well, that's, that, that, that's part of the issues that might change the propensity of people to get vaccinated, to accept uh, vaccination schemes. Uh, the, the largest problem that I see here, and one that I want to come back to, is uh, not the situation that Catherine described for the US, a situation in which there are more vaccines than arms willing to get vaccinated, but the fact that in most of the world, we are not having enough vaccines. And uh, this creates a major, major risk in terms of mutations, etc. So one of the things that I would like to see as a change in behavior is one that looks at global public goods rather than private solutions at the national level. I mean, th this is uh, uh, the, the part in waters in which we will deal with these shocks, which will be more normal. We will become uh, something that we will have to deal with on a more regular basis. And this is what will test us as humanity. So the lasting behavior I would like to see that will change is that we understand what public and merit goods are and we uh, veer away from positional and private goods as a solution to these kind of problems. Professor Milkman, you are nodding. Do you want to add something? Sure, I, I, I might go in a different direction than others have gone just because I think I have a different um, area of expertise in, in some ways. Actually, Professor Hertwig and I have a lot of overlap, but um, I'm thinking about research and that's outside of the domain really of health behavior change and more generally about how this experience is likely to shape our, our future and our behavior change. And I wanted to mention a study that I didn't do, but I love by, um, Larcom et al. that was published based on an event that was very different from this one. It was a London tube strike that happened. So the London Underground, the London subway in 2014, there were a number of subway stations that closed for a couple of days due to the striking workers. And as a result of this, lots of people who live in London and need to get to work had to re, you know, they had to adjust their commutes. They had to try something new. So obviously a really different type of situation than we faced in terms of magnitude, but similarly a forced period where people had to try a different way of life. In this case, it was just a different commute. What I find so interesting about this paper is that the researchers showed most of the commuters after a couple of days when the strike had been going on and, and it ended, they went back to the way things had been. But actually 5% didn't. 5% kept taking new routes they discovered because of this forced experimentation they've been put through. And it was a particular 5%, which is so interesting. They were able to look at the subway maps, see what routes the people had taken when they were you know, going through this forced closure and had to try something new. And they found the kinds of people who were most likely to change their patterns of commute were people who had previously been taking routes to work that were along distorted parts of the subway map, right? Like the map is not a one-to-one -one representation. Some parts are destroyed. So you look at it and you say, oh, this must be the fastest way from point A to B. But in reality, it isn't because it's been distorted to fit on the map. So people who were on routes like that or on, on parts of the tube that drove, went slower, they were the most likely to discover something new and better. So it really was an information gain that changed behavior in a lasting way. And I think that's really important to think about here. So we've gained a lot of knowledge. We never obviously would have gone through this if we could have prevented it, but we were forced to work in new ways. We were forced to socialize in new ways. 
and we learned some things. And, you know, I will not be attending Zoom concerts in the future. I learned that Zoom concerts are inferior to real concerts. So that is not a behavior that I plan to continue. But there are things we learned that were good, right? Like we could do an event like this, for instance, with people from around the world. Everyone could join from their own homes, have a dialogue like this that used to require, you know, huge carbon footprint and time commitment. And that's wonderful. And I think we'll have more events of this nature. There's people who are learning about remote work. So I, I do think it's really interesting to reflect on the fact that um, whenever we're forced to experiment, because we tend to be as humans stuck in our ways because of status quo bias, it can jolt us into discoveries that are valuable. We probably should do more experimenting without pandemics so that we don't need something like this to teach us all those lessons about what technology can do and, and different ways of life. But we, we did learn lessons and I would expect some of our behavior to change because of that. You're so right. We learned so much, but I see um, Professor Hertwig wanted to add something. Yes, I, I actually wanted to add something to what uh, Fernando said, and I think he made a very, very important point by pointing out that there is inequality within countries, but it's also, of course, global inequality and access to vaccination is a prime example of the current inequality. It's actually heartbreaking and striking. And I think uh, one insight or one lesson that uh, the Western countries uh, or the richer countries uh, have not yet learned is that the solution to this pandemic is not local. It needs to be in the end a global solution. Uh, and the pandemic is also a wonderful example, I mean, a wonderful threatening example for the fact that we are indeed dealing with a deeply interconnected global flat world and this is not the only crisis. I mean, think of um, the uh, climate crisis, which is another example of the very fact. And I think we need to start to have a conversation in particular in the richer countries that pick up exactly that point that we are, we certainly can contain uh, the pandemic to some extent, but we will not eventually solve it. We will not be able to return to the normal life, whatever that normal life was. And I think that talking about good communication, talking about trust, talking about science and trust in science, all these things will become very important in having exactly this discussion. I think this is one of the most important discussions to have in the, in the months and years to come. I, I, I fully agree, if I may, even very shortly, of I would course. Like to point out that this, this discussion about equity, particularly in what it is related to vaccines access, is something that's the crucial now. And so if you figure out, for instance, that 10 countries have bought 75% of the whole production of vaccines in these two years, this is something that is really unthinkable. So how can, you, can we assure equity? Equity is the, is the real, I would say, concept, more than a word in this regard. That was very important um, to have. Figuera. Thank you so much. Yeah, Professor Figuera. Now, let's think about it this way. Almost no government would provide vaccine on a capacity to purchase by individuals, right? I mean, governments, when they go to the local level, they see vaccines as a public good, right? You, you cannot uh, use it as if it was something that is a private good. I know it's rival, a vaccine is rival, but we don't assume it in governments as a rival mechanism through exclusionary payment. We give it to all. And in some cases, we even think about making it obligatory or not. Yet, because of what Ralph said, the interconnectedness of the world, we should be treating the distribution of vaccines at the global level as the public good, not at the national level. And that's what we are not doing. I see. I, I would have had so many more questions right now, and I'm sure the audience um, does too. And um, as you are talking, Dr. Figuera, um, you said the Uruguayan uh, government didn't do what you think it should have done when the infection rate started to soar. What would you have wanted the government to do is a question of the audience to okay. you. Okay. Uh, of course, it's never easy for a government because it's balancing. It's a balancing act, right? About the economic, the social, 
and the epidemiological. But there was a, a number of things that we knew uh, in terms of, of scientific certainties uh, in, in November of 2020. A, we knew that no country had been able to avoid the exponential epidemiological curve once, once you could not do more effective testing, tracing, and isolating, and you had community circulations with high levels of mobility. That, that is something that we knew. This is a research that we did. It was comparative. It was all over the world. And the data showed that. Secondly, it showed that mobility would not decrease radically as it was needed unless there were binding decisions made by governments, right? That's the second thing that we knew. Thirdly, we knew two good things, that we could do this for a short period of time, and it would bring us back into the safety zone of testing, tracing, and isolating. And secondly, that vaccine rollout would start sometime in January or February. Uruguay, as a matter of fact, is not having the problem that I'm claiming other countries are having. Uruguay is vaccinating at a very effective rate. Yet, it never, these different things didn't come together to say, it's better to pay the cost, the economic cost, through fiscal support of three weeks of radical decrease in mobility, rather than pay this cost since November to April, in terms of lives and in terms also of economic and social disruption. So I, I believe that at some point uh, the government made a decision, it's a complex decision, but it made a decision of trying to contain an already non-containable epidemic uh, with measures that called for uh, personal responsibility. And what I believe that personal responsibility and good information, and this government did provide, are extremely important in given the characteristics of this virus with levels of mobility to work, uh, to uh, recreation, et cetera, similar to pre-COVID realities, it's almost impossible to contain the epidemic unless you're still in the Tetris mode, in the testing, tracing, and isolating uh, strategy. And, and that is effective. Uh, and to do that, you have to have positivity rates that are below two or 3%. Uh, we already had positivity rates in November that were around 10%, 12% in our testing scenario. So therefore, I mean, uh, of course, I mean, when, when, you, when you say that governments could have done things differently, we can say it of almost all governments. But I believe that at some point, this timing of choosing when to close, when to open, uh, is something that uh, many governments didn't get right. I see another question by the audience that fits very good to what you said right now, but it's um, to or for Professor Dalcolmo. Um, all speakers tell us that populations were ready to change its behavior in an unprecedented way and react appropriate to scientific information, but many governments seem to have underestimated this willingness, willingness of the people to change. Would you agree? In a certain sense, yes and no, because you know we are we are living under this uh, this knife, I would say, this tension between uh, the paradoxical discourses. And there is another question, Vivian, that I would profit on to respond about the tribal and indigenous population in Brazil, how the epidemic is influenced by. And I would like to profit on to respond very quickly. The first epidemic peak in Brazil has been uh, arrived in Amazon region in where we have the, the, the biggest, I would say, indigenous tribes. And the government, again, made an error, made a mistake in sort of uh, making it, their discourse in investing in herd immunity, which was not, it was not right, as we know. So the indigenous population suffered a lot because the very first peak was in April, late April in Amazon, seven months after the immunity provided by the disease 
disease was over, of course, it is expected. So we will need to invest in social distancing and using properly the proper masks and et cetera, and et cetera, everything that we know in terms of social behavior. And it was not done. And the tribal population suffered and the mortality among these people has been very high in Brazil, unfortunately. So this is a very, I would say, precise data that we have from Amazon region in particular, because the new variant called the P1, P1 variant uh, is, was uh, born in Amazon and it reached in a sort of reinfection, particularly the indigenous population. So it's only to provide this information. Thank you so much. Talking about information, there have been very uh, a lot of misinformation too, fake news. Um, how do you think uh, your your countries handled those misinformations? Well, uh, we, we we have been very victimized in a certain sense of this fake information because they have been fooled by the you know. Uh, politicians in a certain sense in Brazil, unfortunately. And now we are having this inquiry made by the Senate in Brazil, as you might know. Uh, so we are having this uh, formal uh, inquiry in, in, the, in the Senate. And so many people has been invited. And I personally has already uh, been advised that I am about to be invited to, to proceed and to be there as well uh, as a specialist to respond some technical questions, if I may. So, but it has been, um, well, I would say, um, so uh, I, I don't want to be longer in this discussion, but uh, I think that this, this can provide and hopefully uh, a good uh, sort of clarifying for the Brazilian population. But fake news has been absolutely fooled by social media and, you know, and it is interfering very, I would say, profoundly in some, uh, some, uh, uh, some groups, some social groups in Brazil, unfortunately. Overall, I would say in Uruguay, it was not the case, uh, as, as Margaret mentioned in Brazil, part of the fake news was being run by the government. So <laughs> that's particularly complicated. Uh, in, in, in the case of Uruguay, uh, and this is a positive thing that Margaret also brought, uh, there was a, an, an early alliance between uh, government and the scientific community to provide the more up-to-date information that could be possible. There are small pockets uh, evangelicals in the border with Brazil, especially, etc., where where some fake news and uh, uh, did did find its way, but it, it it has not been dominant, and that's why I think it's interesting. In, in Uruguay, it's not the case of fake news. It's not the case of a government saying this is not don't do don't do this. This is not important, etc. It's a case of normalization of risk and of death in a context of relatively absence of social support and the need for mobility. And, and, and a government that basically says, yes, let's carry on like this. Let's try uh, to navigate these complex waters. And the result, uh, as it was in Estonia, and as it was in Slovenia, and in Slovakia, that didn't have a first wave, didn't have a second wave, they had a very big third wave or second wave, depending on, on the dates, uh, is that there's only so much you can ask of human behavior, and it was unprecedented, unprecedented what we asked of human behavior to change. But there's only so much in order to control a virus of this nature with high mobility without binding decisions by the government. Thank you so much. There are so many questions coming in. Dear audience, thanks for being so um, active with us today. I totally understand that you have so many questions right now because in my head there are questions and questions and questions and it's uh, yeah, so much information we are getting right now. So um, we try to, to ask your questions. Um, there is one to all, for example. Beyond analyzing the behavior of common people, what is your perception about the behavior of heads of state and government officials about facing a challenge that requires global action? Professor Mulkman, would you like to start with an answer? I want to defer to someone else. I'm going to think about it. <laughs> okay. I see Professor Hertwig, if it's right. 
if I saw it correctly. No, no, I, um, I mean, I'm not an expert on, on that question, but I mean, I think it was rather obvious that uh, the success, at least in dealing with the early phases of the pandemic, was to some extent a reflection of the scientific attitude of the head of states. I think uh, Germany was in, in that regard a very good case because with Angela Merkel, we had uh, a trained natural scientist who also understood the epidemiological models very well and the dangers uh, that the pandemic bring uh, brought. So I thought that in the very beginning and, and for a long time, the communication that came from uh, the government in Germany uh, was really good and was uh, serving uh, the purpose of making people aware of the dangers. And of course, there are spectacular examples to the opposite. Um, and uh, I mean, Brazil is such an example. Uh, and I think Margaret alluded to that repeatedly. Um, it's, Donald Trump is probably another example. So uh, and, and then it goes back to one of the things that I tried to mention earlier is that the issue of good communication and trust. If a government undermines its own uh, institutions and its own experts, and, and I, I think that um, President Trump, of course, was an unfortunate example where he, in press conferences, undermined his own experts and his own agencies, uh, that does have consequences, uh, consequences for the behavior. And in that sense, I think the lesson of the pandemic is, yeah, absolutely, that um, the governments and, and their attitude and also their investment into their agencies and their expert uh, has consequences for uh, the behavior of the citizens. That, that seems, I mean, I don't know any study of that, but that seems a pretty safe conclusion. Thank you. Professor Figuera, you want to add something? I, I think it's uh, what Ralph mentioned. At the start of the pandemic, and for the first months of the pandemic, uh, it was critical, the position that heads of state assumed regarding the information they had, their trust on science, uh, their capacity to communicate clearly and to present a common front with the scientific community in terms of the decisions being made. As the pandemic rolled on, I think that there, there, there are more nuanced differences, even within heads of state that were basically responsible about this uh, on, on, again, how to handle the different stages of the pandemic. And thirdly, I think the question meant also heads of states and the issue of what comes after, uh, what have been their positions regarding global vaccination schemes, et cetera. I believe there that we have some bad news. I mean, COVAX, the, the COVAX mechanisms has so far been a failure. That basically suggests that a multilateral cooperative uh, decision that depends finally on that the heads of states and the governments of the different countries are willing to forego some immediate popularity within their countries in order to create a broader uh, insurance scheme for the global uh, situation uh, is not working. And, and, and I don't know where the leadership will come that uh, will allow uh, the world as such to understand that uh, global solutions are required. So that that's a third issue of how heads of states are gonna are gonna operate. We are running out of time, but we still have some questions. So I will keep on um, asking you, Professor Milkman. One question for you: How can we include uncertainty in the communication without making science sound uncertain? Uh, these questions are good. I wish I had great answers for that. How can we include uncertainty without? Um, so I think, I think the, the best is a little bit of a dodge, which is a funny answer to give. I think we want to say, you know, this is what we recommend. Um, this is what we advise and, and use language that does not convey, like, we are positive that this is the best action when we're not, because we want to be honest. But I, I think emphasizing, you know, we're 30% chance, you know, 30% certain that this is going to be useful th that could create lack of confidence. So um, I guess that's my best answer. I'll, I'll say that I would also, there's a wonderful book by, by Don Moore, who's a professor at um, UC Berkeley that's called Perfectly Confident. And it's really about uh, calibration and how do you 
how to ca you calibrate your confidence and also how do you communicate a bit, a bit. So anyone who's really interested in this topic, I would point you to Don's work. He's really the expert. I know he would have given a better answer than I just did. That was totally fine. <laughs> and um, I saw a hand by Professor Hertwig. Yeah, I, I just wanted to add something to what Catherine yeah. said. And uh, I think that um, I would be more optimistic in the sense that it's an article of faith that if we communicate uncertainty, then this reflects badly on science. But I think the pandemic was extraordinary in demonstrating what science can do, starting from a lot of uncertainty to doing work and building up more and more knowledge, not necessarily more certainty, but certainly more competence and knowledge and in the end, even a vaccine. So maybe uh, being able to, to communicate uh, uncertainty is also an act of honesty that in the beginning, when we deal with a new crisis like this, we simply don't know. There's a lot of things we don't know. And maybe this was a lesson both for scientists, but also for citizens to see uh, science in, in operation and how it works, and that it is uh, a cumulative enterprise that tries to reduce uncertainty. So I'm a little bit more optimistic. I think that maybe uh, the citizens have also learned that uncertainty is not necessarily a bad thing and that we can overcome it. Thank you. And this is, ah. this, is the, this is the reason why, Ralph, that I have mentioned that, that the first good outcome in Brazil has been paradoxically exactly this. So society can recognize that there is a sort of national science, if I may call yeah. it this way. Yeah. And so when we are recognized and say, oh, you are the doctor that speaks on television, that writes, etc. So it's it's nice, you know, it's effective. It's more than cognitive, it's effective. Effective, and so it does represent something. We as, as scientists, when we do analysis, especially for example, what the examples that Catherine was providing on randomized trials, etc., we work with confidence intervals, we work with statistical significance, and uh, of course, conveying that as such could be problematic. Uh, and I understand how Catherine mentioned it. It's, well, it's 0.23 of the beta effect on a confidence interval of this or that. But I think we can provide two things. And I think there has been a learning process from the scientific community also in how to communicate. A, what we do know. There are certain things that we do know. Uh, and then bounded uncertainty. I mean, understanding uh, that there are certain things that we really don't know at all. There are certain things that we do know. And then there are certain things that we have a pretty good background of information and analysis that suggests that this is the direction or this is the direction. So uh, separating those three things in a way uh, that it becomes communicable by political uh, authorities and by uh, health officials, et cetera, uh, is, is a learning process that both goes ways, I believe. It's so interesting to have a discussion with all of you right now, but concerning our, I always have a look at the um, clock too. So there are two very important questions left, uh, which I wanted to ask you. Um, one is for uh, Professor Hertwig. Do you already have any results or assumptions that people will include some security measures in their daily life, even after the pandemic, to protect them against other illnesses? For example, to take the most Asian countries as an example, and wear masks in daily life and trains and buses, etc. Or do you think people are tired of all the health instructions now? Mm -hmm. Well, so I don't have any data. I cannot judge that. But I think a, it's important that we actually do learn uh, globally from uh, other countries and see what are the things that really worked uh, uh, in the short term, but also in the long term. I think that will be very insightful. Uh, and secondly, at least from anecdotal evidence, I do meet people who tell me, you know what, when the flu season comes, I'm going to wear a mask. Um, I'm, I'm not sure how sustainable that behavior will be and whether it will be picked up. But I think it was amazing to see is that, uh, that we basically didn't have a cold pandemic in uh, the last year or around the turn of the year. Uh, in Germany and Europe more generally. So I think that some of these things uh, are going to be picked up in particular, if again, it's supported by good communication and opportunities. So these things need to be available. That's the other uh, important issue here. And that goes to the issue of inequality. To end with a question concerning our future, 
to all of you who want to to add something once the pandemic is over do you expect to have the roaring 1920s in the 2020s <laughs> <laughs> professor figuera is laughing do you want to answer this question uh, uh, I, don't, I i i really don't know some people say that th th there was a wonderful economist that talked about what he called public and private cycles in, in, in life, uh, in, that, that the world had gone through public and private cycles, uh, periods in which people would go out and would uh, uh, enjoy life in common, et cetera, and there were major political movements, et cetera, and then periods where there was a certain privatization of, of life, uh, the 50s in the US, for example, et cetera. Uh, I don't know. I don't know if we're going to a private or a public cycle. We have the seeds of both. Uh, an explosion of sociability and of re-engagement at the public at the collective level because we have gone through all these difficult times or uh, both health issues and uh, technological changes that have come to stay and that will uh, make us less likely to go out, etc. So both things might eventually happen. I, I, I don't know how to guess there, uh, really. Uh, I, I'm looking forward for the Roaring Twenties, but I, with, with responsibility. But uh, I don't know if that's going to happen. <laughs> OK. Um, I want to, to ask you for a take for a take home message did you learn something right now did you learn something in the discussion with all your uh, co-panelists i'm very curious to hear about that we have only yeah a few seconds left for each person so please uh, have a short answer or give us a short answer and i'm very um, interested uh, to hear that professor daikomo would you like to start Yes, thank you so much. First of all, Vivian, for your excellent moderation. And I'm very honored again to be among all of you. And so my message for, the, for my country is trust in vaccines, fight for vaccines, and do not take social and economic health as an economic, I would say, procedure, but instead for a public health procedure. This would be my message for my people. Thank you so much. Um, what about you, uh, Professor Hertwig? Uh, yeah, also thank you very much for uh, letting me be part of this panel. It was really interesting. I think what I learned uh, most or what impressed me most was both uh, Margaret and uh, Fernando emphasized the issue of social inequality. And that is, I think, uh, a key that we also as behavioral scientists have to think more about. Thank you. Um, Professor Figuera, do you want to add something? Or yeah, well, uh, Ralph said it. I think that uh, within and between country inequality is one of the major uh, challenges that we will have to confront in the future, not just for this pandemic, but for other global uh, events that will disrupt uh, our life. And secondly, uh, there are four spheres that both produce risk and provide us with some insurance for that risk. Uh, states, markets, families, and communities. Uh, we have come to understand that while markets are extremely important, uh, families, communities, and states are the ones that have to step up when markets cannot deliver. And this was the case of the pandemic in many ways. Uh, so we need to invest more in communities and families so that they are more resilient. And what about your message, Professor Milkman? I, I'm going to echo the last two and really saying um, I think global this is a global problem and leadership at a global level would be ideal. We still haven't seen as much as we need of that. And, and hopefully we'll learn that we can't live in isolation in our countries and expect things to turn out well if we have good policies. It has to be a global effort. And I hope we'll, we'll do better in the future and, and even in the months ahead. Thank you. It's so important that we listen to each other, that we talk to each other, that we have meetings like that one today. Um, that's 
yeah, my opinion. And um, that's why I wanted to thank you, our honored panelists, our audience, um, our um, interpreter. Thank you so much for, uh, trans for the translation from English into Brazilian. I would never have done that. <laughs> I would never I could have done that. So um, thank you so much. And um, I would say goodbye, stay safe and take care, everyone. Bye. Até já. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. <laughs>